I'm um, welcome to you all today, the Cambridge Center for Christianity Worldwide, CCCW, as we call it. Um, and a warm welcome to both our uh, regular uh, friends and participants, as well as uh, to those who are joining our events for the first time. I'm Muttaraj Swami, uh, director of the center. Uh, we are very glad to have with us today, uh, Dr. R. David Moir, who will deliver today the second of the five uh, CCCW Silver Jubilee Lectures. We also have Dr. Yog Hostin, uh, who will chair the session. Dr. Hostin uh, is the World Christianity Lecturer in the University of Cambridge. He will introduce Dr. Muir in a moment. In a moment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David and Yog, uh, for being with us today. This CCCW Silver Jubilee Lectures um, as we are celebrating the 25th year of the center, as well as um, 140 years of the Henry Martin Trust that runs the center. Uh, so the, the Seller Jubilee lectures are organized uh, to mark uh, this event. There are five um, lectures organized throughout 2021 uh, on the theme, Transfiguring World Christianity, uh, focusing on uh, figuring out various concerns and issues. So today's topic is engagement, figuring out Christian mission in societies. And the future topics are science and world Christianity, ecumenism, and reconciliation. Those who missed the first lecture on the topic, uh, solidarity, figuring out world Christianity and the pandemic, uh, the beauty of the lecture is now available on the CCCW YouTube channel. A few housekeeping things before we proceed. Uh, please keep the audio uh, button mute, uh, muted on your screen, uh, Zoom screen uh, during the lecture. Uh, during the question and answer time, please unmute um, when you speak. The lecture will be recorded and anyone who does not want your picture to be part of the recording, uh, uh, you may turn your video off. Uh, the, um, and answers, um, the conversation uh, session will not be recorded. Uh, the lecture and discussions will come to the end at 5.30 p.m. Uh, but there will be, that is one and a half hours, but there will be a 30 minutes informal conversations and those who would want to stay on, you are very welcome to stay. Before I hand over to Yog and David, um, the third lecture on science and world Christianity is scheduled uh, on the third June, um, and also uh, before that, on 9th June, there will be um, a, a CCCW webinar that we do in collaboration with um, the uh, Faculty of Divinity. You are very welcome to join uh, these events. And please email us if you would like to register for these events. And more um, more details about the Silver Jubilee lectures and the sender available uh, in our website, ccw.cm.ac.uk. Uh, and um, if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you want to join our events or you know, if you want to have any questions, please uh, feel free to write us um, at your email. I now hand over uh, to Yog uh, to chair the session and introduce David. Thank you, Mutaraj. Um, and let me just join you in saying what a pleasure it is to have Dr. David Muir with us today. Um, as you have seen in the announcement, he is currently um, at Roehampton University, where he's not just lecturing, but also uh, the head of uh, Whitelands College. And um, he came to Roehampton uh, after his PhD in political theology from Kings via a number of different institutions. I'm not going to read them all out. Um, but just to mention University of East of London and London Metropolitan University, so you also see, and this is some, something I'd like to highlight, uh, that he taught in areas where racial engagement uh, really, really matters uh, in the higher education sector as well. Um, and I, I, before I hand over to him, I really just want to highlight two aspects that I think are, are of importance. Firstly, um, in David Moore, we have somebody who's not just a theologian who comments on political events, but somebody who has been engaged in politics, both on the side of government, but also on the side of the church. So already 
uh, in uh, the early 2000s. He was the head of the uh, uh, Verdi inquiry into uh, racial discrimination with the MPA, uh, Metropolitan Police Authority. Uh, he's a member of the UK uh, pol government policy action team. Um, he's a member of the Transatlantic Roundtable on Religion and Race. And quite importantly, also um, a, one of the uh, um, co-authors of the Black Church Political Manifesto, where Caribbean and African churches in the UK have for the first time come out and given out a political manifesto. So this is a political engagement that's not just uh, sort of a theologian speaking to politics on behalf of the church, but also actually rallying churches around to try and understand what the Christian mission means uh, in the world and in the world of politics. And secondly, and this is something that I find absolutely fascinating, is that in David Moir, we have somebody who knows both liberation theology and Pentecostal theologies and Pentecostalism intimately. Um, and for those of you who know anything about either of these topics, uh, you, you would probably think never the twain shall meet, but in David Moir, they do. Uh, so we have an expert on uh, James Cone as well as Pentecostal prosperity theology on uh, uh, you know, uh, black theology as well as uh, Pentecostal migrant churches. And I think that makes him an, an extremely interesting speaker for our time um, here today. So I'm really, really looking forward to your lecture on engagement, figuring out Christian missions in societies. Thank you, David, for coming. I think you're still muted, sorry. Not yet. Jenny, gotcha. hey there. Gotcha. That's it. That's I, it. Noticed, I noticed that my um. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. And you know, I always get a bit worried when people say that you're an interesting speaker. <laughs> um, but I, I noticed that my 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 colleague and I can't see everyone. Uh, Julian uh, Gutterbed is uh, with us, and Julian and I, of course, were colleagues at uh, Roehampton and he has departed from us um, last year, and we miss him terribly, especially during this difficult time of marking. <laughs> um, but what I want to say is, you know, is that um, uh, I was going to do a PowerPoint. Then I was stuck thinking, well, maybe PowerPoints often get in the way of what one wants to say, but I've got a paper-ish. You know, some of the things I want to talk about I may not get to talk about all of those things, but I'm hoping that you know, in the discussions, some of the themes and issues may emerge. And for me, um, the theme of, of transfiguring world Christianity, engaging with uh, Christian mission in society, I think it's timely. Uh, it's also complex and challenging. One has only got to pick up the newspaper and see where we are and look at some of the things which are taking place in the world to realize that as the Chinese say, we certainly do live in interesting times. And when I was invited to give this second lecture, I guess I was forced to take stock and to listen to multiple voices. We have to do, I think what John Stott advocated, and that is that we've got to engage in the kind of a double listening, listening to the word and listening to the world. And I think in, in strictly uh, Barthian, terms or the Barthian imperative, this is about paying attention to the Bible uh, and to the newspaper, allowing the former to, inf to inform and interpret the latter. And although I recognize that the Christian mission is, fund is fundamentally the same, i.e. It, uh, it hasn't changed because I think the mission is still quintessentially about making Christ known and making disciples of all nations. I don't think that has changed, but I do know that how this has worked out and embodied is diverse, it's developmental, and it can be at times extremely, extremely um, dangerous. The Christian mission in society, as I said earlier on, is fundamentally the same as it always has been. Making Christ known uh, through the power and witness of the Holy Spirit is critical. And of course, uh, Adrian Hastings uh, talked about the word mission. And for him, the word mission represents one of the most decisive, but also complex themes within Christian belief and life. Its purpose 
is no less than the proclamation and the immediate inauguration of salvation seen as a divine gift of liberation, both spiritual and temporal. For Hastings, of course, God's mission can be summed up in the following quotation. And what is this mission? Well, it is manifested above all in the full round of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ. The task of the sent ones is to proclaim the word of God, to enact his works, and by doing so to generate among women and men a fellowship which is in some way already the society of God. The works of God, of course, are the works of justice and compassion, whereby women and men are liberated here and now from some of the immediate physical hardships of injustice pressing upon them and are thereby able to experience what is truly a certain beginning to the liberty of God's full kingdom and proclaimed in this world. Of course, similar ideas can be found in the great Howard Thurman and of course, uh, James Cone, especially in his uh, 1975 book, God of the Oppressed. And I know that uh, the work of course of mission has to be seen as a Trinitarian endeavor in soteriology. It is a work of the church, and therefore it is a work that all believers are called to engage with. Whether this is done through simple apologetics and witness in the Petrine sense of our readiness to give an account of our faith and the hope that is, that is um, constitutive of it, or through service and advocacy on behalf of the poor, the disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, the so-called least of these, the mission is expressed in service of one kind or another. And for me, public theology has a critical role to play in all of this because public theology can also help us how to figure out what our mission should be, could be, what it might look like in society. Raymond Plant uh, defines public theology as the formulation of a theologically uh, coherent account of the moral issues facing public policy in a complex society, but also facing up to what uh, might be seen as a sort of a meta task to do with arguing for the role for theology among the voices in society brought to bear upon this question. And then of course, Max Stackhouse tells us that the trust and the justice that informs public theology is fundamentally rooted in a God of compassion. And that as truth as it is told, as well as we can tell it, must be spoken in love. Love and regard for human experience is the fourth criterion, the complete and boundary for a public theology. I think it's important for us to think about our personal mission and the contribution we want to make to, to society. I recall back in 207, during the bicentenary celebrations, Christians, especially evangelicals, at that time, I was a public director uh, at the Evangelical Alliance for Theology and for Public uh, Policy. We were heavily involved with Baroness Amos, David Lamy, and others um, in the bicentenary um, celebrations. And I do remember the, the, the great honor that many of our Christian brothers and sisters rightly gave to William Wilberforce. And I wanna say something about him because it seems to me that when you look at some church's mission and some of the things they have outside of their churches to tell you what they are, sometimes the names can be a, a distraction for what they're trying to do. But for me, William Wilberforce had a very, very clear and a concise vision for society and for himself. In his diary, he wrote, God Almighty has placed before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. While the reformation of manners was surely a noble object, its quantifiability and discernibility are more difficult to capture. However, in regard to the first object, 
history bears testimony to his achievement and to his Christian engagement. And of course, although Wilbur Force, that eloquent parliamentarian, is duly recognized as the so-called prince of the abolitionist movement, one called him the very, very son of the uh, Clapham system, according to Jane Stephen. There were countless other men and women who made significant contributions to Wilberforce's personal uh, and noble vision. I think of my great hero, uh, someone like Thomas Clarkson. I think of Alura Equiano, Henry Thornton, Ottawa Coguano, Branville Sharp, Elizabeth Herrick, Sarah Wedgwood, Anna Moore, Sojourner Truth, James Ramsey, and countless other Christian brothers and sisters who saw their mission and political engagement as their first calling. It was not unnecessarily complicated, I think, this simple vision. It was laconic. There were no multiplications of entities, as it were. Like so many visions and missions, they need corporate effort for fulfillment. In biblical terms, we need women, men, and men and angels on our side. Wilberforce had these aplenty, and the energizing zeitgeist certainly helped, even though the Egalian dialectic should have portent the emancipation of the enslaved and their rebellion as an inherent uh, corollary of the inexorable laws of historical destiny. While many Enlightenment protagonists were blind to this, the energizing zeitgeist and the self-liberation ethos of the enslaved were captured by those who went against the ideology of their class, of their age. Unlike those who saw the rebellion in the Caribbean with fear and foreboding, and as an upsurge in brutish, as they said, brutish uh, savagery, historians like Hilary Beckles and Thomas Clarkson affirmed that the self-liberation ethos of people trying to free themselves was the very, very unalterable rights of men to freedom. This self-liberation uh, ethos was quintessentially captured in, Will, in William Wordsworth 1802, sonnet to Toussaint Louverture, the leader and general of the revolution in Haiti and the victory over Napoleon, creating the first independent black country in the Caribbean. And once Wordsworth said, though fallen thyself never to rise again, live and take comfort. Thou hast left behind powers that will work for thee, air, earth, and skies. There is not a breathing of the common wind that will forget thee. Thou hast great allies. Thy friends are exaltations, agonies, and love, and man's unconquerable mind. I believe that there is a critical relationship between our theology and our engagement. That relationship can be understood as a theological truth and their intersection with social reality. After all, as social beings, it is the social that gives rootedness and meaning to our interaction. This, of course, was a fundamental insight of Emile Durkheim and his central idea of the social fact. However, I want to invoke the Tillichian notion that this critical intersectionality might be posited as that between the eternal truths of the gospel and how that is worked out and choreographed in each succeeding generation. In other words, the church and its theologians are constantly required to appraise and reassess the truth that informs and influences their mission and the social situation. And in this tension, this dialectic, there is, a there is a seductive tendency to lose one's equipoise. And by this, I mean the relevance of the theological truths and their incarnational and transformational power to do what is soteriologically and anthropologically constitutive of the good news and the messianic disclosure challenging the subjugation of the spiritual regime or bondage. The thief 
says Christ in John 10, 10, comes to take away our freedom and diminish our life chances and our life choices. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the work of the enemy. The mission of Christ, and by implication, our mission is to engage in what I may call a great reversal. Jesus proclaims that he comes to give life in abundance. I almost feel like saying hallelujah. But I think figuring out what is constitutive of Christian mission in society and what it means for the church, theological educators, and all of us in particular, is a daunting task that must perpetually uh, be undertaken with much humility, prayer, and tears. I say tears partly because we have in our legitimate rush to do good in, co in contributing to addressing many of the urgent social, political, and environmental challenges of our time, we may have lost our ability to weep before we speak. I know that I too am guilty uh, of this. Figuring out this stuff or figuring this stuff out is not easy. Dare I say it's not a walk in the park. We're going to need a great deal of help from above and from below. And some of the answers to many of our intractable problems would only come as we read in the scriptures what Jesus intimated in saying that some of this stuff can only come through prayer and fasting. The spiritual practices that I witness as a youngster growing up in my own uh, church and community, people talked a lot about certain things only being able to be solved through prayer and fasting. And in the face of our cognitive, philosophical, and pedagogical work that needs to be done in the intersection of church and society, Christian vision of making Christ known in the world, as it is, as well as to how we may want it to be, maybe we should pause for thought as we reflect on something that the Catholic theologian, uh, Nicholas uh, Lash, reminded us of. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're a philosopher, whether you're an activist, Nicholas uh, Lash reminds us that in history and in philosophy, there's always good academic work to be done on the question of God. Work as rigorous and demanding as in any other field of study. And yet, he says, there is a sense in which if such work is not done, at least metaphorically on one's knees with one's shoes off, then it will miss the mark. So in this address, I want to attempt to contribute a little to figuring this stuff out, to do a little bit of double listening uh, with my shoes off, as it were. I want to contribute to thinking about some of the issues that we are faced with, but I want to do that through the prism of a, cu of, of, of a couple of urgent and pressing contemporary challenges namely racial and environmental injustice, and our response to them as we think about our engagement and mission in society. Uh, I want to end with an idea I borrowed from the philosopher Michael Sandel that is second to our thinking, and it may help us to think through some of these issues. Sandel talks about contributive justice and how we might develop it beyond the dictates of the market and, uh, and transactional consumerism. I am, of course, very conscious that any meaningful Christian mission and engagement will always have a Trinitarian foundation. It would also be informed by the personal, the political, and the prophetic. I hope elements of, of this will be disclosed in the reflection and the discussion that follows. In the introduction to his essay on Tolstoy and history, Isaiah Berlin references a line among the fragments of the Greek poet Archilochus. And the fragment says something like this, 
The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows only one big thing. As an undergraduate, I was fascinated by the infinite and messy midrash one could bring to, to this line. Isaiah Berlin relates this figuratively, uh, figuratively to what he argues relates to the deepest uh, differences which divides writers, thinkers, and dare I say activists. These are uh, human beings in general, I think. And for him, this fragment can be interpreted in this way. Berlin says that there exists a great chasm between those on the one side who relate everything to a single central vision, one system, less or more coherent or articulate in terms of which they understand, think, and feel. He talks about a single universal organizing principle in terms of which alone all that they are and say has significance. And on the other side, he talks about those who pursue many ends, often unrelated and even contradictory, connected, if at all, only in some de facto way from so, for some psychological and physiological cause related to no moral or aesthetic principle. These last for him lead lives, they perform acts and entertain ideas that are centrifugal rather than centripetal. Their thought is scattered or diffuse, moving on many levels, seizing upon the essence of a vast variety of experiences and objects for what they are in themselves without consciously or unconsciously seeking to fit them into or exclude them from any one challenging, all embracing, sometimes self-contradictory and incomplete and at times uh, fanatical uh, unitary in a vision. The first kind of people, says Berlin, are the kind of intellectual and artistic personality that belongs to the hedgehogs, the second to the foxes. And he argues that without insisting on the rigid classification, and of course the use of ideal types here might actually help us, we may, he says, without too much fear of contradiction, say that in a sense, people like Dante, belongs to the first category, Shakespeare to the second, Plato, Pascal, Hegel, Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, and Proust, to a varying degree, are hedgehogs. Herodotus, he says, Aristotle, Erasmus, Goethe, Pushkin, and Balzac, even Joyce, are foxes. Of course, like all classification and ideal types, Berlin admits that there can be oversimplification leading to artificiality, even absurdity. However, even if, as he concedes, the dichotomy does not furnish a perfect aid to serious criticism, there is a sense in which the distinction he makes does embody a degree of truth, a starting point for genuine investigation. And from the midrash of possibilities inherent in this fragment, I want to identify with the hedgehogs myself. I want to relate the unitary inner vision, the organic principle to one thing, one big thing. I'm calling it hope justice. And forgive me, because here I'm in danger of transgressing boundaries a mild cognitive and intellectual mission creep away from Berlin's typology. I'm straying into the territory of the fox. I don't want to settle for just one big thing. I actually, I'm a bit greedy and I want two. I suspect that part of the lexical uh, fluidity of the categories, the typologies that we can playfully appropriate may help us to think about some of the big things, or maybe the one big thing that's taking place in our world that we need to pay careful attention to. Of course, I want my one big thing deciphered from this fragment to be justice, but I want to clothe justice with hope. I don't just want it to be a mere abstraction. I want all of us to see how we can do justice, 
how we can embody it in our politics, our anthropology and mission. In short, Sandel's idea of contributive justice might have a way to help us. It might goad us and help us to shape how we view our community. I now turn to environmental justice because during the Jubilee 2000 campaign, many of us were aware that Christians were in the forefront advocating for the poor of the world and for the cancellation of debt. Today, we all know that there is a climate justice agenda that churches, Christians, all of us need to engage uh, in with greater or equal vigor to what uh, Mike Oakley said over a decade ago. And I guess he's probably right because what he said then maybe still applies to so many of us. And of course, despite Al Gore's inconvenient truth, it still appears that ecology, says Oakley, is irrelevant for many Christians. And there are those who, who invoke that brand of theology that says that issues of sustainability and climate and environmental justice and the campaigns around these issues lack efficacy in light of their eschatology. In other words, if God is going to destroy the world or the things that will be are ultimately doomed to the great conflagration, why bother? Why bother to get involved? Why bother to advocate for creation care? Let us exploit the environment to satisfy our consumerism. Let us continue to extract all we can from the earth to satisfy our greed. Let rampant capitalism reign and let the chips fall where they will. Apocalypse is a peculiar, deadly fantasy, according to Ted DeLay. And this fantasy linked with climate denial is creating a fertile ground for alliances so plainly exhibited between evangelicalism and Wall Street. Why does this alliance exist? What has Christ to do with the Tao? Their goals are not identical, but there is a shared ethos in future denial. Capitalism has little incentive to think beyond the next financial quarterly earnings report, while evangelicals deny the future in a more literal sense. The two parties share an affinity, not goals, and they curate their alliance with multiple mediating apparatus. Clandestine radicalization happens completely out in the open. And by the end of it, the deregulation of industry like the petroleum industry intertwines itself with heartfelt religion until there's no daylight between them. For Dalai, in effect, to be a good citizen in some parts of his own country, America, is to destroy the world. And if we wish to postpone, he says, the end of the world, we should understand the nature of this resonant machine, its fatalistic fantasies and its commitment to destroy. The previous occupant of the White House had a particular theology, if that is not too complimentary a view of his cognitive formation. And it's too easy to engage in name calling with terms such as climate deniers in the debate about environmental justice and the science around climate change. Pulling out of the Paris Agreement was not only an attempt to undo another prudential move on the part of President Barack Obama, it was also to pander to the political theology of a sizable uh, section of the evangelical right. We don't have time to go into the theology of uh, the new right in America, populism and its implications. But I think we just need to be mindful that as they say, uh, when America sneezes, the world catches a cough, even a cold, dare I say pneumonia and lots of other things. 
And in this regard, we must also remember remarkable people in Africa, in the South, the global South, who've been doing this and advocating for this a very, very long time ago. The remarkable environmentalist Wangari Mathai was warning us of the impending climate catastrophe and the need for urgent action from the industrialized uh, polluters long before Al Gore and David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg. In her Canopy of Hope, which was published in 202, um, she drew attention to the intersectionality of the environment and, just, and gender justice. Later, she made politically explicit what the Brandt report of the early 1980s um, had merely rationalized as the self-enlightened interest of the rich North helping the poor South. Wangari Mathai saw clearly the destructive legacy of colonialism and the effect of rampant capitalism on the African landscape and on global warming. This amazing campaigner and environmental activist reminded us a few years before she died in 2011 about the cruel irony inherent in the discourse around environmental justice and climate change. She said, and I quote, there is a cruel irony in the fact that the negative effects of climate change will be felt most keenly by those least responsible for creating global warming. As major polluters, the industrialized countries have a responsibility to deal with climate change at home, but also to assist Africa and the rest of the, of the uh, developing world to address its effects. Wangari Mathai has left a very, very powerful legacy for all of us Christians and non-Christians to be mindful of. And I don't want to lose sight of uh, David Attenborough's efforts because he does ask the question and I think rightly so. And that is how can we encourage the wild again and bring back some stability to the earth? He said that we don't just need a new philosophy but rather we need a return to the old philosophy. One way where we we gain our balance, where we move back from being, and this is the thing, apart from nature to being a part of nature. There is something fundamental about this admonition that is more than a nice play on language. And I think the pandemic, the thing that we all see is aftermath in front of us, has touched us all. It has terrorized us. It has killed millions. In the face of nature's cadence of desolation, we saw ourselves, we saw others, and we beheld our mortality and vulnerability in the face of our brothers and sisters around the world. In sympathy and solidarity, there was humility, but there was also a resolve. In Du Boisian term, we too, were resolved, many of us felt resolved to do something. We saw neighbors check in on others. We saw strangers taking food parcels to the vulnerable. We saw men and women weeping. We saw and we were touched by the deaths of so many who could not be there to touch or to speak to their loved ones before they were taken. I believe our world has changed radically in the last decade and more. After the financial crisis that put the world in shocks, we were greeted with the global pandemic. COVID-19 not only arrested us, it humbled us. And it forced us to think about not just nature, but it forced us to think about the world we want for ourselves, our fellow sisters and brothers. And while we we're in the midst of a global pandemic where the virus was killing a disproportionate number of black and brown people, we saw a modern American horror. As a law enforcement officer, Derek Chauvin kneeled on George Floyd's neck, not for the nine minutes and 46 seconds that we were led to believe, but rather for nine minutes 
and 29 seconds we later learned during the murder trial. George Floyd's death has changed the world. Thanks to the near universal technology, the ownership and the use of mobile phones and its democratic distribution and dissemination of messages and images through social media, the world saw the public and brutal murder, the execution, yeah, the assassination of another unarmed black man by a law enforcement officer in Minneapolis. He was unarmed. He was not resisting arrest. He was compliant. Thanks to this new form of citizen journalism, captured by the 17-year-old Darnella Fraser, we witnessed the meaning for many people, for many African-Americans, the meaning of America. And what is that meaning? Well, it's a sign, it's a symbol of what it is, what it has been and continues to be for many African-Americans. The American uh, philosopher, the African-American philosopher and cultural critic, Cornel West, would argue that what we saw, what the world saw, is far from exceptional in America. It's normal, he would argue, where black bodies have had the life sucked out of them from the day they arrived in the so-called new world, whether through extracted labor, through chattel uh, slavery, post-reconstruction Jim Crow laws, practices of public lynchings. If I were to ask my, my friend, the late Professor James Cohn, he would respond, and those of you who know him, in his inimitable high-pitched voice, he would say, David, this was a public lynching on the streets of Minneapolis. This was an extrajudicial punishment sanctioned by centuries of dehumanization of black bodies. Doubtless, my friend James would point me to what he argued in one of his latest books about the cultural politics of the lynching tree, namely that it's the most potent symbol of the trouble nobody knows that blacks have seen, but do not talk about because of the pain of remembering. But let us not be naive. The defense of ignorance is infantile. What we saw in the death of George Floyd was neither episodic nor singular. It was institutional, structural, perpetual. African-Americans have known through their long night of slavery, dehumanization, racial discrimination and death, the experiential, psychological and existential meaning of I can't breathe. The white officer's knee on George Floyd's neck is a visual reminder, a picture and a metaphor that will be etched on the memory of many people around the world for generations to come. It will be one that African-Americans, diaspora communities and others will not want to forget. My good friend, Robert Beckford, led a number of seminars with Anthony Reddy and others and Richard Reddy around the twin themes of environmental justice and racial justice. And we are all reminded of what Americans own profit said so many years ago that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The tragic death of George Floyd has certainly inspired a global insurrection, an insurrection of solidarity, sympathy, and common decency in the face of a brutal and brazen murder of another black man. Christians in America and elsewhere have got to think about how they do mission, what mission means, how they handle some of the tricky issues around reparations, around restitution, around forgiveness. How do we figure this stuff out? How do we figure out where we stand in the face of racial injustice and racism? How do we come to terms with our own agency in the struggle against injustice and our complicity? Whether out of silence, or as beneficiaries of the legacy of injustice. If you have blood in your veins and you know the free and divine gift of breath, no one can watch what happened to George Floyd and remain unmoved. Indeed, one white American commentator, in fact, it was John Kingston, uh, writing in Christianity Today, for a predominantly white Christian audience, puts it like this. He said that if you are not angry, 
and feel deeply sad and feel deep sadness at this moment, it may be time for a soul check. So whether one listens to the historian David Olasoga, the writer Ben Okri, the journalist Nesreen Malik, or one of the June editorials in The Economist, one cannot help but to see the ubiquity of racial injustice in both the UK and the US. And although the government sponsored commission, recent commission on race and ethnic disparities and its chairman, Dr. Tony Sewell got a good duffing up by both journalists, politicians and academic commentators for denying the existence of institutional racism. And some would argue that by implication, the suggestion that all is well in the UK and there's not much work to be done in this area. We saw a genuine effort by the Church of England and the Archbishop of Canterbury to, to move to, to actually uh, move the dial significantly in the direction of racial justice, equality and equality. The report from Lamento Action gives us reason to hope. I'm hopeful, especially after the unscripted apology in General uh, Synod by Justin Welby to the Windrush generation of black Anglicans. And the current debate about monuments in church and society runs the danger, I think, of substituting practical and restitutionary action for more talk. Therefore, I was particularly interested, and there I say a little saddened, in reading Dr. Um, Nazir Ali's, the former Bishop of Rochester's uh, criticism of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the new guidance on church monuments and contested heritage as diktats, issues from Lambeth Palace and Church House, arguing that this is about conceding ground to identity politics and critical race theory, where people are taking their inspiration from so-called woke warriors. If woke warriors are concerned about racial justice, if woke warriors are concerned about environmental justice, if woke warriors are concerned about treating people with the dignity because they are divine image bearers, then I think uh, uh, my good friend Meze Ali has got this one totally wrong. It's a pity. I think the Dr. Ali couldn't see this more as a part of the church's wider mission that is engaging with contemporary issues and pressing conversation about the place of historical monuments, artifacts, and contested heritage. Engagement is always dangerous and open to scrutiny. But in this case, and the politics surrounding it, the church, in my view, has chosen to enter the debate. And of course, given its visible sign and presence in communities up and down the country, instead of being insular, the church has decided to be at the center and not on the sidelines. I wanna suggest that theologically George Floyd's death may become to be seen as a grain of wheat that the scripture talks about that falls into the ground and dies, hopefully producing a harvest of greater justice, fair treatment and dignity for individual as image bearers of the divine. Many people across racial and cultural divide feel that the death of this man is a defining moment, not just in American history and race relations, it's also a defining moment in global history and how we deal with racism, discrimination and injustice. It is a turning point, it is a tipping point. It has inspired interracial and intergenerational protests on both sides of the Atlantic. The name of George Floyd will be memorialized. Individuals and institutions will remember his name as they reflect and respond on racial injustice and other challenges they face. I can't breathe, says the writer Ben Okri, will become the mantra of, oppressing, of, of oppression um, globally. As I draw my short reflection to a close, let me pick up on St. Augustine and Michael Sandel. For they both speak to what I feel is important in our mission and how we frame and practice our engagement with society in society. I hope we will get time to explore some of this in the discussion. Michael Sandel in his new book, The Tyranny of Merit, What Becomes of the Common Good, has much to commend it. 
not least because he, he critiques the dystopian notion in um, a book that was printed in the 60s entitled The Rise of Meritocracy by Michael Young. His notion of the contributive justice, I think can help us to participate more fully in society and contribute to the common good. Everyone wants to contribute. Contribute is part of that which gives people dignity. It provides opportunity for mutual flourishing, social recognition, and the esteem in contributing and producing to what others need and what they value. This idea, of course, is rooted in the belief that we are more fully human when we contribute to the common good and earn the esteem of our fellow citizens, those with, with whom we share a common life. I remember back in early June when I spoke at Roehampton University's Blame Staff Network after the murder of George Floyd and its national and global implication. I said then that I was hopeful about the future and what and that as a Christian, I would redouble my efforts and courage to fight injustice wherever I confronted it. Napoleon once said that leaders are dealers in hope. I certainly believe that to be true, but we need more than hope. As this might end up being merely wishful thinking without action and personal struggle. However, in St. Augustine, I believe we encounter a Christian realism that combines a judicious and prophetic balance for the challenges of injustice we face in so many quarters. Hope, says Augustine, has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. May God help us to keep hope alive as we courageously and prophetically reimagine what Christian engagement might look like if we prioritize hope justice or if we prioritize contributive justice. Thank you.